So this morning I want to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. I will read it in about four or five different translations so that you will get exactly the gist of it. Most of you know the passage, 2 Corinthians 1, 20. The Bible says in NIV that no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. New Living Translation says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. The English Standard Version says that for all the promises of God find their yes in him and that is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. King James Version says that for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Amplified version says, for as many as are the promises of God in Christ, they are all answered yes. So through him, we say our amen to the glory of God. And so because of this passage and as God blesses the reading of his word, I prophesy to you this morning that every word of God concerning you every word that is written, every word that is spoken, that today as you say resounding amen, that you receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Jesus is a very unique figure. He's unique in many ways. He's unique in the sense that for every stage of his life, there was an announcement. Before he was born, there was an announcement. After he was born, there was an announcement. Before he went into ministry, there was an announcement. After he went into ministry, God still found a way to announce him. It means that at every stage of his life, not only was God with him, but God found a way to make sure that everybody understood that his son was alive and with us. Jesus also bears many titles. When you read in scripture, he is the king. He is the king of the Jews. He is the king of kings. When you read the scripture, he's also the son of man. At the same time, he's a servant. At the same time, he is God in the flesh. In fact, it was interesting, one of the disciples asked him, did they show us the father and we'll be satisfied? And he was a little bit disappointed. He said, if you have been with me all this while and you are still looking for the father, he said, this is all that you get. We also know that Jesus is a miracle worker. He's also a teacher. He's a preacher of the word himself. And so Jesus is a character by himself that conveys so many aspects. And so according to that passage, whenever God speaks, there is a seal that is put upon that word. And that seal is the name of Jesus. And so that is why me and you can be rest assured that unless it has not been spoken, as far as it has been spoken, God will not contradict himself and make a fool of his son. As far as God has said it, it is going to happen. Amen. And so when God tells a man and says that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, you don't need to look any far. You are, you are rightly seated. Amen. And so we know that Christ is the seal that God has put on all of his promises. And brethren, I can guarantee you there are many of them in scripture. There are some personal promises. There are promises to the nations. Second Corinthians 7, 14, for a second Chronicles says, if all of my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. He says, in fact, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And so we know that Jesus is not just the guarantee, but we know that Jesus is the one that God himself looks up to to make sure that 
as he speaks that those things are done. The Bible says in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Bible says that nothing was created that was not created through him. It means that when Jesus himself says, before Abraham was, I am, he knew what he was saying. That even before God ever thought of Abraham, I was already there. And so Jesus is the seal. Tell your neighbor, Jesus is the seal. And the seal is that thing that makes sure that the promise can never, can never be shaken. Amen. When I was preparing, I thought to myself, there are so many passages in scripture that talk about the benefits that we get from Jesus. But then I looked at Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, I won't read it for because of time, but I want you to go back to it. And I know it's a part of scripture that most of us don't read. Because the word that is common in Matthew chapter 1 is the word to begat. It says, and so, so begat, so, so. It started by saying that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, right? And then I say, then it says, and Abraham begat Isaac. And then that same word begat went on until he got to Jacob. And then he said, Jacob begat Joseph, who, as it was supposed, is the father of Jesus. And then you, the Bible then tells us that that portion of scripture is divided into three parts. Each of the parts has how many generations? 14 generations. And those 14 generations are unique in certain instances. I'm going to take one of them that I'll talk about this morning. To let you know that when Jesus seals something, nothing can change it. When Jesus seals your promotion, nobody can change it. When Jesus seals your healing, nobody can change it. When Jesus says that you will not die, nobody can change it. And that is because the seal cannot be erased. Amen? Amen. Somebody told me about what is called, what is called a disappearing pen. A disappearing pen is a pen that fraudsters use. So when, they, when you go to them, they will sign a check for you. Before you get to the bank, the ink has disappeared. <laughs> and so when you get to the bank, the bank will say, but the check is not signed. Meanwhile, the fraudster has already taken a picture of the check when it was signed. Don't you thank God that you have a God that his ink does not fade. Amen. So when the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, it says, and Abraham begat Isaac. Right? Now I want to look at what does it then mean and why is it significant that it talked about going from Abraham to David as the first set of 14 generations. Brother, let me just put it very simply. Whenever God starts dealing with people, it starts with the individual. God goes to the individual to the corporate level because it is the individual that makes the corporate. And God stopped at David because Saul, as it was, number one, was a Benjamite. And number two, Saul had been rejected of God. And so the name of Saul never happened in that genealogy. And so Saul might have been the first king but when God is reckoning, God does not reckon Saul as being even part or even existed. The only reason that we read about it is so that, number one, for our learning, and number two, we can understand the way God works. But Abraham is a man that suddenly, the Bible talks about him in Genesis chapter 12. That is when it comes to light. And the Bible says, and God said unto Abraham, Abraham, Get up, leave everything that is common to you, and come to a place that I am going to show you. I want you to note one thing, brethren. There is no coincidence in the kingdom of God. Amen. When God does something, God has it planned. I also want you to know that God's purpose is complete in Jesus Christ. And what that simply means is that the purpose of God for you is complete. As far as you will work with God to get there. God has started the path. That is why the Bible says, thy word 
What is the word again? Jesus. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What is the word? The word is Jesus. The Bible says in that genealogy, or let me just say that if you notice that that genealogy for some reason did not start from Adam. It was Luke in chapter 3 that traced it all the way to Adam and he traced it the other way around. And so there must be something unique about Abraham. Abraham had challenges. How many of you are aware of that? Abraham had major, major challenges. If Abraham had challenges and the word of God was what he needed, he tells me that you will have challenges. And the challenges are not such that they will overwhelm you because they could not overwhelm Abraham. Amen. Now, let me, let us open to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And the reason I want to open to Genesis chapter 11 is that I want to paint a picture for you to see here that Abraham had already given up hope. Because when we say God is a God of hope, when we say Christmas is a season of hope, there is a reason that we use hope as one of the first things that we talk about. When God was going to send the son, he sent his son so that the hope of the world can come alive again. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, is 75 years old. We all know that, right? Now, in chapter 11, God, for some reason, gives us an idea. Let us look at Genesis chapter 11, and I'll read, I won't read it, but I'll just go by, I'll just go step by step. When he begins to talk about the generations of Shem and all of them, for some reason, they gave us the age that they gave back to their first children. For some reason. The first one there, the Bible says, and when he became 100 years old, he begat. You can see that one. That is in verse, verse 10. Right? Now, go to verse 12. What happens? The, the one now that was begotten at the age of 35 begat his own son. So what has changed? What took his own father 100 years to accomplish? It has taken him how many years? 35. Are we still together? Yes. Now, go down to the next one. His own son, it takes him how long? 30 years. Then the next one, 34. Then the next one, 30. When you get to verse 20, 32. Verse, 30, verse 22, 30. Verse 24, how many? 29. <laughs> and so what do you see that is happening there? The age is gradually reducing. Now, we get to Terah. And the Bible says, and Terah was how old? 70 years old. And then now he begat Abraham. Now, if Abraham had any references at all, his father would have been considered very late, a very late achiever. Are we together? Now, I don't think there's anybody here that when you see that everybody in your lineage were given back at 31, 32, 34, 29, I don't think you want to hold on to 70 as your own ideal for giving back. Are we together? Now, so what does Abraham do? Abraham has looked at himself. He knows all the story and he says, it is too late. And the reason it is too late is because what natural history tells him says that if people before you are doing it at 29 and 32, 
then how is it possible for you to do it at 75? But then there's a reason why I'm saying that. There are many of us that when you look at the way others do things, when you look at how long it takes others to do things, you begin to ask yourself, is it not too late? Are we together? Some of you might have been in the country for five years. Some of you might have been in the country for ten years. You've noticed that people that came in seven months, they bought a house. But you have been here for six years, you have not bought a house. So you are beginning to ask yourself, is it too late? Some of us, you will notice that you've had a first child, glory be to God. But then you notice that the second child is not coming. And then you begin to ask yourself that time is going. Some of us, it is promotion at work. You have been working and you know that everybody that has worked in that department before you got promoted after six months. You've been there for 18 months. And yet you're asking yourself, what is happening? So Abraham is not different and his thinking is not different from all of us. But God then says that Abraham come out of where you are and you are going to go to a place that I will show you and from you I will build a nation. Now, that may be easy for us to understand but let me take you back. Remember when we defined the word, we said the word was what? Jesus. So the minute that God said it to Abraham, Jesus got to work. Jesus, knowing fully well that once the word is spoken, it must come to pass, has to make sure that as far as that idea ever came out from the mouth of God, that it must come to pass. And that is why, brethren, it doesn't matter. God speaks in mysterious ways. Somebody might have told you, brother, don't worry, your time is coming. Maybe that is the word of God for you. Amen. Somebody might have told you that, brother, don't worry, it can never be too late for you. That is the word of God for you. Somebody might have told you that you might have been rejected in so many places, but a time is coming that people will seek after you. Amen. That is the word of God for you. And so you will notice it is never too late. Hallelujah. If Abraham had challenges, brother, you will have challenges. Wow. The word of God spoke and Jesus began to act. Amen. That is why Jesus is the hope that will never fail you. Is the hope that will never disappoint a man. Is the hope that even when, when you have not done your part, it will find a way to help you. Amen. Because the word has been spoken. Amen. What other thing do we want to learn from Abraham very quickly here? Because the word of God is sealed about Abraham, God overlooked his doubt. Did you get that? Is there anybody that doubts once in a while here? Yes, occasionally. If God could overlook the doubt of Abraham, but then God will overlook your doubt. Amen. Abraham, you know, let me, has it ever happened to you that God will tell you something you can't even afford to tell your wife? Because you will think that you are, you, are, you, are, you are not well. So Abraham could not tell his wife until God himself had to come and tell the wife. And then now he knows that now we are on the same page. It wasn't me that told you. Right? And so I want you to understand that the word of God that sealed it for Abraham, it overlooked his doubts. The greatest enemy that you will have, brethren, let me just say this very quickly. The greatest enemy that you will have believing the word of God is time. That is the greatest enemy. In fact, let me tell you the truth. The devil is not the greatest enemy. The greatest enemy is time. That is why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36, it says, after you have done the will of God, so you have need of patience. When God told Abraham to leave, did Abraham leave? Yes. Did he have to wait? Yes. In the presence of waiting, Abraham defaulted, and we all know the story. I pray that you will not default in Jesus' name. Amen. Abraham left the familiar because of the word. 
Brother, when the word has gone forth, don't hang on to the familiar. The familiar keeps you on the spot and it robs you of what God wants to do in the future. Abraham left the familiar because the word was spoken. After hearing God, Abraham was always speaking words of faith. Hallelujah. Brother, let me tell you the truth. God sees your heart, but the things that you say are the things that can count against a man. When Abraham heard the word, Abraham did not understand the word. But Abraham believed the word. And so let me tell you the two things Abraham did, which I will encourage you to do. When Abraham is with God, he's truthful to himself. He said, God, how will this thing happen? You said I'll be a father of many nations. Is this this servant in my house that will be my heir? Is he being truthful to himself? Good. But when Abraham is outside, and he's going to sacrifice his son. And he says, boys, you wait here. Me and this boy, we will go and worship and come back. And at that time, did he think they were coming back? You know, sometimes when people tell you that it is well, it sometimes it's a statement of faith. Are we, are we together? And it is because with their mouth, they don't want to say the opposite of what they are praying for. The second thing, that, the second thing you will see in that same story is, as if it was not enough, the silence could have killed anybody. Abraham is walking with his son. All of a sudden, the son opens his mouth. He says, Father, there's something different. I have followed you on this journey many times. He said, I have the firewood. I have the rope. He said, but <laughs> there's nobody else following yours. Where is the ram? Abraham asked himself, do I tell this boy? <laughs> <laughs> and the Bible says that Abraham said, the Lord has sent me there. He will provide. As the Lord sent you anywhere, he will provide. Amen. As the Lord brought you to the land of Canada, you cannot lack. Amen. As God himself sent you to the place where you are working now, you cannot lack. Amen. Why? Because the word of God is sealed by the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is why it is always good whenever we say our prayers, we end by saying that in Jesus name, we pray. Let me try to round this up. When you think about Abraham and you understand that the word is sealed, but then you, you know that God has many ways that he works. In fact, the Bible was saying in Hebrews chapter 11, is that Abraham even reckoned that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. Remember that passage? Yes. But do you realize that before Abraham's time, there was no record that anybody was raised from the dead? But yet, he could think of it. That God, do you know what that means? That God will do everything possible to make this promise to come to pass. Even if God has to raise him from the dead. Meaning that if God could not prevent him from dying, if God could not do anything else, God can still raise him from the dead. Brother, your dreams might have died. Can God resurrect your dream for you or not? Amen. You might have forgotten the vision that God gave you. Can God bring back the vision or not? Amen. You, don't, you don't think so? Amen. Now, let me end with this. The Bible says that through faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, that he obeyed. He went out, but he did not know where he was going. That is faith. If you know where you are going, you don't need faith. When you don't know, then you need faith. You need faith believing that the one that has promised is able to keep 
his promise. When occasionally somebody will tell me that, Pastor, God told me that I will be this. And then in the same vein, the person will say, but I can see that some people are trying to kill me. Then I ask myself, if God told you, then God will keep you alive. Amen. Have you thought about it? Yeah. If I tell my son that next week I'm sending you to on vacation to Australia, am I going to do everything to send him to Australia or not? I can't keep him alive, but at least everything that has to do with the finances, I will do. So when God says that you shall be the head and not the tail, is God able to do that or not? He is. When God says that you and your children will be for signs and wonders, is he able to do it or not? But uh, let me now tell you one last secret. I have come to a stage some long ago in my life that I don't care how God does it. In fact, I always tell my wife, I said, two people don't need to worry about the same problem. Is that about one is wasting his time? And most of the time, who is wasting his time? Me. God says, I will help you. And then you yourself, you are asking yourself, who is going to help me? But God already says, I will help you. God says, when you pass through the waters, he said, you will not overwhelm me. Is that not what he said? Then suddenly now you see water and you are running away. Are you believing God? Except Jesus is not Jesus. If Jesus is Jesus and the word spoken means that Jesus has been told to act, then it means that God cannot fail. But then as we begin to wind down towards Christmas, there are some things you need to understand. When people ask you, tell them that your Jesus cannot fail. Not only is it that your Jesus cannot fail, that what men are seeing now is not the end of the story. You are still in the middle of the story. Is there anybody like that here? That I may be where I am now. But that is not the end of me. The Bible says that Abraham saw it afar off. It is a journey of life. And it's a journey that Christ will take you to. And so this morning, brethren, understand that thing. That whenever the word has gone out. In fact, I want to encourage you, begin to look at scripture. If possible, go and buy a Bible of a, a, a Bible that has promises highlighted. You know, one of the challenges I have realized in life is that I cannot claim a promise I don't know. Are we together? And I learned that from my children. They come to me and say, Daddy, can I have that? Once you say yes, children have a gift they don't forget. Once you say yes, they can even ask you in uncomfortable places. <laughs> Suddenly, visitors are everywhere. The child will run there in three minutes. And the child will say, Daddy, that thing that you said, the visitors are hearing. <laughs> are you going to say no? You know, I've realized that sometimes, unfortunately, some of us as parents, we are the ones that have destroyed the faith of our children. Because the only father they know is you. And you are constantly disappointing. And yet you say that God does not disappoint. And so they ask themselves, if you are a representative of God, then maybe I don't want to know that God. Brethren, today, God will give you grace. Amen. God will give me grace. Amen. That each of us will take it. Amen. That we have that seal. And that seal seals the promise. And the promise is that it will be well with you. Amen. The promise is that your tomorrow will be better than today. Amen. The promise is that the Spirit of God will be your help. Amen. The promise is that it doesn't matter where you go, it's rather than the staff, they will comfort you. Amen. His promise is that as far as they are planted by the rivers of water, that you will bring forth fruit in your season. 
your leaves will shall not wither. In the name of Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand on your feet and begin to talk to God this morning? Why don't you stand on your feet and begin to talk to God this morning? The Lord, from today, I recognize the seal over my life. I recognize the seal over my marriage. I recognize the seal over my ministry. Yes, I recognize it. It will not fail.